Today is brought to you by the Nordic Initiative and UND Integrated Studies and the Norwegian Language Program at UND. And, the, and actually, Olin Einer Durham is our 122nd guest from Norway. I looked it up today. <laughs> and so we're very, very delighted. But actually, that's not entirely true because this is his second visit, so I'm counting him twice. <laughs> <laughs> he was with us in September of 2009, gave a great speech and uh, on what's going on in the Arctic. And today, it's a, really a talk about something that's become very, very important in the world, and that is Norway's role in NATO and the changes that have come and are coming with Trump and Putin. And so it's a very good, and I'll give you some background. Anders is a well-respected politician in Norway. He was elected for four terms uh, in Norway, member of parliament, uh, the first time from Trondheim, three times from Oslo, which is also very unusual to be elected from two different parliamentary districts. He has served as the Minister of Transportation, and he's also served as the Minister of Justice. And he's also one of the best champions we have of the American College of Norway in Parliament. And we have needed Parliament support with the American College of Norway, and he was superb. I'll let the, talk about that because today's focus is really is about what is this relationship we are very close to Norway here because of it's our heritage but we also this is very important Norway's role in the world is exceptionally important for many many reasons and they can do things that America can't do so please give a wonderful American welcome to Oleg Einar Durham This presentation is a challenge. So I will treat you like intelligent analphabets, in the sense that you are supposed to know nothing, but you will pick it up fast. <laughs> so first, I will not speak about Norway. I will speak about NATO, very shortly, basics. It's Norway in NATO, the geopolitical facts concerning the high north, and I give him short, explanation of that in a short time. And then after those PowerPoints, your eyes will rest on the map. And after I presented that map, I will speak about the two great game changers, Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump. So let's start. But first, if you look at the world today, I think most people will be afraid something is happening in the Middle East. Could happen. And people will be really afraid something is happening in Asia. And uh, in Europe, if you forget about Ukraine, I think you shouldn't do that. But in Europe, it's peaceful, and high north is peaceful. So, one of my reasonings here is to try how to keep it that way. Because something which is peaceful must not necessarily keep on being peaceful. And I will show some disturbing facts, which presents a change in the situation. So first, about NATO. This is the official part of NATO and the best map I found. But the, the map shows Europe and the Northern American continent. And NATO was created as a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It united the democracies of Europe together with Canada and the United States. And it kept the peace since 1949. And it brought the Soviet Union through Reagan's initiatives down. And it was brought down. Everybody thought it was the time of peace and love and friendship. So it's, it's very hard to put it this way to say that for some reason, living through the Cold War, being a young person during the Cuba crisis, Afterwards, read everything which has come into the open on the Cuba crisis, especially on the things that nearly went wrong, nearly went wrong, but did not, thank God, go wrong. And then say, well, that was a predictable time. And now, with not being predictable, I don't think, I think, I don't think about the President of the United States and Mr. Putin. I think about the spreading out of nuclear devices, nuclear weapons, 
being brought possibly, possibly, but that was prevented, coming to the hands of people who have no, no anxiety to be dead. No, it's, it's a great, great glory to die and take as many people as possible with you. So that's a game changer. So how in those situations to keep peaceful places peaceful? And my, my short title before we go into this is that it's the ultimate D's of international politics. The first D is called deterrent. I have a sword and you have a sword and both of us know it. And the part number two is dialogue. We are not interested in not talking to each other. We are not interested in stumbling into something. something. We want to be precise about what's happening and so on. So that's NATO. And NATO, very short description, 28 countries, all alliance decisions shall be taken by consensus. They have a pledge to support each other. In NATO, it's called Article 5. Article 5 has been used only once, once. And when was that? That was after 9-11. <coughs> and the US were reluctant to use it. Because if, when it, if it was used after the attack on the Twin Towers, <laughs> what would be next? But as a result of 9-11, NATO was activated as partners together with the United States in Afghanistan. And Norway has still troops in Afghanistan. So that, that, that's part of it. So the first time NATO ever was brought into the situation was not during the Cold War, from 1949 to 1991, it was in 2001. It's a basic fact. So, one of our prime ministers sometimes said this beautiful sentence and sentence full of nonsense. No way is a country in the world. Yes, it is. But there are many countries in the world. So, Norway has been a founding member of NATO since 1949. We had before the extension of NATO into Eastern Europe, we were only one or two countries with a common border with Russia. The other country was Turkey. And Norway is not a member of the European Union, but we are a partner of the European Union in the sense that we are all part of the same market. We are pragmatic people. We don't want to be dictated by other people, but we want to make trade. So that's a short version. The islands of Spitsbergen, Svalbard, and Jan Mayen are Norwegian territory, far to the north and far to the northwest. Spitsbergen were given to Norway after the First World War because of neutral Norway's staggering shipping losses. So it was in the Second World War also, staggering shipping losses by the merchant marine. And because of that, Norway got the choice between former German colonies in East Africa. And we had the sense to say no and we got Spitsbergen. So Spitsbergen is part of Norway, but it is a treaty which give all countries in the treaty right to be there, but they have to adhere to Norwegian laws and there should, shall be no military in Svalbard and Spitsbergen. So nowadays this is a big, great scientific activity there and also have made many investments at Svalbard and Spitsbergen because of the satellites orbiting through the globe around the globe and bringing data down. And also I've also been with the cable to have a fast speed deliverance of internet as fast as possible. So there is some big American investments here. Norway's strategic position, let's start with that. Norway is on the top of the world, but not so much the top of the world as you see. But Norway is a country, if you go around the globe, you will see ice and ice and ice. But according to the, due to the Gulf Stream, the hot water stream coming through the Atlantic, it's liberal. If we had taken away the hot water stream, Europe would not have been a place to live north of Spain. So that's a basic fact. So the Gulf Stream is very important for us. So we are close to Russian strategic bases, which is to the north of Norway. And because of the development of the world, where Putin was the first man, I make Russia great again. Oh, he said that. And that means that all the money in a country which has lots and lots of economic troubles, really lots of them, you have built up your military forces very fast. 
pay in some ways, uh, better, better, even on the same level as Western countries, the US, and even better. So they've done that. And because of that, all the Russian presence to the, to the east of Norway is stronger. So this was never a symmetric situation. It was asymmetric. And it's been more asymmetric now than before. And Norway is a country close to the sea. And if you look at the coastline of Norway, it is 28,000 kilometers if you take all the fjords in and out. And that's 70% of around the globe. It's much sea, much coast. And those fjords, I think, would be very well known to US commanders of nuclear tipped submarine. And so, but also for the Russian counterparts. They have maneuvered here during the Cold War. And if you look at the global map nowadays, you will know that is something is difficult to conceive. During the Cold War, this was a peaceful place. But if it had not if it had not been peace, it would have been close to destruction. And those operations below the sea level, the US and Russian submarines played hide and seek. Well, parts of it has been presented in the Red October by Tom Clancy and so on, but tough game, tough game. So I think there is lots of people here with a good understanding of the geography of the sea bottom. So this is the position. And if you have a bigger picture, you will see Russia, Canada, and Alaska, and you will see the small country of Norway. And if you have the even bigger picture, so what are, what are the countries here? These are all the countries which is member of the so-called Arctic Council. The Arctic Council is a low-key place where people come together and solve practical problems. So who's members? All the five Nordic countries, the United States of America, Canada, Russian Federation. Who is the observers? China, China, India, and the European Union. How come? Well, they are interested in research. They're interested in the melting of the ice around the North Pole which for people like me who don't like that kind of climate change is disturbing, but from another perspective is, op is opening the possibility for very shorter and important shipping lanes from Asia to Europe and across the world. So they are interested. And I was present as a Minister of Justice in November 2005. We, we opened a research station for marine studies. Chinese came from Beijing, traveled for three days, stayed there for one day, and traveled back three days. They had decided it was an important place on the globe. You take notice. And we understood. The high north, I described it here. No, nowhere is very important in the high north. Up to now, high degree of stability and cooperation, vast resources, fish and oil and gas, climate change, melting of ice. How many US politicians have bothered about this part of the world? Well, the first level was John McCain and Hillary Clinton. They traveled together in 2005. And the only Minister of Foreign Affairs in the US who has attended the Arctic Council was Hillary Clinton and then John Kerry. And why did they do that? Well, they understood that you must give some credibility to something which is functioning. And if you represent the superpower like the US, you want not to spread your resources if you can, if, if this possibility for not doing that. To, to, to give credibility to something which is functioning is okay. 2008, I studied different groups in Washington, DC. I found a small group in the State Department to do something about this. And they asked me in 2008, don't you know we are fighting a war in Iraq and Afghanistan? And I said, of course I know that. But I'm not asking you to fight the war. I'm only asking you to be aware. It's possible to be aware without fighting a war. And I shall not now speak about the icebreaker gap. But Russia has lots and lots of icebreakers. That is not the case for the US and Canada. So if you want to be peaceful, you also have got to have the equipment to deal with. So this is the map describing the situation. So NATO is a cornerstone. Cornerstone on Norwegian security. I spoke about Article 5, 
There's lots and lots of training and exercises, I come back to that. The NATO challenges is number one. It's always been keeping NATO relevant for the US because it's not possible to have a critical NATO without the US. It's not possible. It's not possible. This question of economy, burden sharing, all American administrations has always asked European countries to do more. Trump is doing it his way, and it's fair enough. It's fair. And if you speak a tough language, okay. So that's fair. But uh, all of us have learned to listen to Mattis and McMaster and other people. And we know they have knowledge. And we listen to their knowledge. And we understand that they want to stick to agreements. If they shouldn't have kept those agreements, I would have to say, you cheat on us. You, you asked us to be, I come back to it, to listen to the Russians, close border, to everything. And we have done, done that in an open face. But they have not behaved that way. They said, we stick to the agreements, but you have to pay more. Fair. I repeat, fair. So, in Norway, as it's shortly about how we deal with the tents, are some of that is here too, too long. It's a very short presentation of Norwegian armed forces. I shall not get that either too long either. But around us, there is an increased Russian military capability. And what we have noticed is that the Russian capacities to deliver land power forces fast is strong. The capacity they had to stop anything by electronic jamming is strong. And we read, for instance, the Chicago-based Real Clear Politics and Real Clear Defense and other sources. We know the story of the US destroyer coming into the Black Sea and running away because the Russians jammed everything. So not stupid people, they're clever people. And not, Norway have last year a big NATO exercise in our easternmost country. Our, after our standards, Five to 10,000 people, as much. What did the Russians do? A week afterwards, without notice, they transported 125,000 soldiers very fast to the neighboring to Norway military district. Message, we see you, but we can deliver. So perhaps not being presented in this part of the world because I think most people doesn't understand where Norway is. And, and at one time, I read about a uh, Toronto-based newspaper, Global Mail, and it spoke about the high military activity in Norway. I started to laugh. That spoke about Norway approximately <coughs> around 67 degrees north. That's not far north. Perhaps far north, seen from Ottawa and Toronto, and even from Washington and so on. It's not far north. You should be much farther north than that. You should be you should be much more north than 71 degrees north, and so on and so on, and look at the globe. It was an interesting article, but it gave no information to people. It was interesting to see it, but it was laughable, in the sense that the journalist didn't understand what he, what he was writing about. You have to look at the map, and you have to understand the map. So, this is a short presentation. This map is showing the, to, the, to the right, the Kola Peninsula. And what is the Kola Peninsula? That is the biggest Russian military complex for nuclear ballistic missile submarines. And the Russians, after the Second World War, has made themselves a promise. They lost millions and millions and millions of soldiers and civilians. So if they should come to a war, it shall never be fought on Russian soil. So this is their map. The dark one is the map where they should have the control, and the gray one is the map that would like to have control. And if you look at the gray one, you have most of the Norwegian coast. So this is a debate which a previous Norwegian Minister of Defense, Mr. Stoltenberg, father of the present Secretary General of NATO, said. He said, in 20 years, we got to make the following. Shall the waters to the north of Norway be Russian inland waters, a Russian lake, 
or shall it be international waters? And if it shall be international waters, you have to keep up all the institutions which keep the Horn off a peaceful place. And you've got to have a credible deterrence. This is Russian military bases to the north of Russia towards the Arctic Ocean. So how come they build up this? Well, they've done that for many years, and I think <coughs> the most careful way to present it is that there's lost resources here. And they want to be there. And they want to train people to be there. So this is how they've done it. And it's an official Norwegian military map. You can see it goes from to the east of Norway and to the Strait, Bering Strait. Up, up, up. It goes to Alaska and so on. It's, it's very big. And then, what is this? Computer game? No, no. Mm -hmm. Russian bomber movements along the Norwegian coast. Mm -hmm. Nothing after the collapse of the Soviet Union, increasing. Mm -hmm. Always in international territory, but close to the borders. Mm -hmm. Norwegian running ex ex training excellence to send up two F-16 fighters. Follow them and follow them closely and see we see you and you see us and so on. Daily. Big activity. All kinds of planes. Big activity. And uh, yesterday, the Russian ambassador to Norway sent uh, an article to the Norwegian Daily and said that if Norway goes further on, which has not been decided upon, to be part of the US initiated missile shield against missiles, which from the US side has been decided to protect US and other countries from possible missiles from Iran. We have to take military measures, and I don't mean to attack Norway, but I would uh, translate it into the following. We have to just pinpoint some of our missiles, the nu nuclear warheads, towards your cities. Or well, we have to do something, and you will notice. I think this is not a wise way to keep Norway as a quiet country, because if you threaten people, you have a tendency not to accept it. So, if you, Norway up to now has been a country being very strong in the NATO, but given the room because of the wiseness of Norwegian politicians, because of the accept of US politicians, to be a place which could play two roles. Role number one, to be a credible member of NATO. Role number two, to use soft power peacekeeping in all parts of the world where the great powers have no credibility. You can just be present where the US and the Russians and so on have no credibility. You can just be there and do things which is in the interest of humankind. But if you shall do that, you have to combine the position which has existed during the Cold War. That was to be a very strong, strong NATO member. And remember here, Gary Powers, who was shot down over the Soviet Union in 1960, at the end of the term of President Eisenhower, his plane started in Bode in Norway. And all those plane flights went from Norway to Turkey and back again. It was a not a clear war. And the US had casualties, because there was air crews on those missions. So it's been part of it. But at the same time, Norway had three things which Norway said without being dictated by anybody. First, there will be no nuclear weapons on Norwegian soil in peacetime. So we follow the same principle as Clinton did with gay people in the US Armed Forces. We didn't ask and I didn't answer. <laughs> we, we, we can always think of the thoughts what was on board the US submarines, but okay. It was not on land and that was the case. Point number two, there shall be no fixed basis for foreign soldiers in peacetime. And point number three, the easternmost part of Norway is 30, 31 longitude. That's of almost the same level as Istanbul. It's far east in Europe. And Norway could actually have been two time zones, but that is not practical in a small country, so we have one time zone. No military exercises to the east of the 24th longitude. And uh, we experimented with that when we had an act exercise with those five or 10,000 a year ago, and the Russians reacted with 125,000. 
But during the Cold War, this was regulated. Everybody knew what they should do. At least that was the idea. And afterwards, everything came tumbling down. And now it's possible to rearrange it. So for, if there for some reason should be a rapprochement on some questions between the United States and Russia, that should be a good thing. But that should always keep in mind the importance of the NATO alliance. It's possible to combine it, but it needs skills. So I was one of the persons who, yeah, my brief become more and more, more quiet when I read about John Huntsman being ambassador to Moscow. I think he's a knowledge ship, a man with knowledge, a man with background. And I found it remarkable because he had stood up against Donald Trump twice at least, <coughs> as I noticed reading papers. Okay, fine. The import person is critical of you. That's okay. That's okay. I used to, sp I, tr I try to speak of those things on this map because this map is something you should remember. And this is shortly about the two things in Norway nowadays. We have made a long time military plan which will make us buy 52 F-35 planes, new submarines, new P-8 Boeing managed P-8 Mar maritime surveillance craft, air defense. We do intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. We modernized our land forces, we have our host nation for training exercises, and we do special operations forces, all of that. And to achieve that, before I speak about this map, we, will, we have increased our defense budget for the first time ever. Because we feel that we are in an environment which is, which is no joke. We are a very peaceful country. We don't like wars. But we have seen the necessity to strengthen our defense. And to be to, to be to buy that hardware which you looked at, that's expensive. It's really expensive. We have a national debate on that. I shall not take that up so far. But I will end this presentation before you can look at the map and before I speak shortly about Putin and Trump. So what is this? Well, it's Norwegian US bilateral cooperation. What is that? It's intelligence. So when Norway became a member of NATO, what could we give? What was our bank account? Intelligence. <coughs> that goes to Russia. We are ships in the ocean. Civilian ships are all listening, just listening, listening, listening on all activities. There is agreement on there are, there are AWEX operations, flying observations, and we have we have a great cooperation with planes who are making surveillance of the sea and what is done in the sea. And the US military got very excited, to put it very shortly, when this system didn't discover a Russian submarine with nuclear missiles, which certainly was observed outside the US Eastern Seaboard. So people can be shaken <coughs> So we have bought new planes, and it, this is very important. It's intelligence, and then there's a very strong Navy cooperation, and the Norwegian Air Force, it, it, they're just, I educate in the US, whole families are living here. The young children go to school here, because it's so specialized, so it's, it's integrated in a sense. And then we have home guard training, which has have taken place in this part of the US, in the Midwest. And the other kind of it is corporations in the Nordic area. But the main thing on this Norwegian US bilateral cooperation is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance on important military questions, especially nuclear submarines. And Norway, you can see at the map, is so close anything that we make a difference on that information. The second thing, which is reinforcement, I think that one of the biggest US expeditionary possibilities in the world today is the storage of heavy equipment for a US Marine expeditionary unit of 4,500 soldiers. 
I think nowadays all that kind of stuff is being placed on ships, except on Norway. And no way there's a possibility. You can go into a friendly country and take out equipment and put it back in there without bothering anybody. And the manual mode storage is where we used in Afghanistan and other places. Now that the equipment has been, been brought back again. And there has recently been established a training exercise going the year around with approximately 300 US Marines all around the year in the central part of Norway. Because one of the restrictions we put on ourselves towards the Russians was that equipment for allied reinforcements, that is mainly US military reinforcements, will not be put in the north, but in the center of the country to keep a distance. So, so there's quite a lot of bilateral contact here, quite a lot of it. So when you see this map, that's, you can look at the map when I finish my speech, because we have to bring Putin and Trump into this in a sensible way. We can start with Putin. He is the great game changer, because he decided to make Russia great again. And he built up the Russian military. <coughs> He made all the things which we are aware of in Europe. And remember here, in 1975, during the Cold War, it was agreed by the US, the NATO countries, Soviet Union, everybody, that in Europe, 1975, all the borders should be kept as they were. In plain English, that means Germany accepted to have lost the Second World War and had to pay for it. And part number two, it should be a possibility to speak about human rights anywhere in Europe. Anywhere. And then, 1996, when that very important thing in the history of mankind happened, when some countries voluntarily gave away their nuclear weapons. And how come? Well, the former republics of the Soviet Union, Kazakhstan, Central Asia, White Russia, bordering to Western Europe, and Ukraine gave away the nuclear weapons. It was returned to the Russian Federation. So in 1996, it was made an agreement in Budapest to sell the United States of America, European Union, the Russian Federation, guarantee the borders of Ukraine. So this is history here. And after the Second World War, after the tremendous big work done by Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt to put the ideas of Franklin Roosevelt, which was there is no contradiction between peace and bread and freedom and bread. You shall have freedom and you shall have bread. That was put into the United Nations Charter. And after that, you got the Charter for Europe, which was the Human Rights Convention for Europe, the, the, the Court for Human Rights Questions in Europe, and the Council of Europe. All those institutions are now rattling. Because Mr. Putin has said that, he hasn't said that he doesn't like those institutions. He put it another way. All countries should be independent and they shall speak together. Well, in Europe, that was the situation before 1914. Uh, translated into plain English. The strongest bully in the street is the chief. And all other people have to adhere if you translate it not from being polite, but very direct. So, shaking in that, and if you take down all those institutions, we, and part of that is, of course, NATO. And uh, so when Putin did that, President Obama went to the Baltic states. <coughs> US president went to the Baltic states and said, this is NATO territory. And the Baltic states, at least Lithuania, one of them, is one of the few countries in Europe who spend more than the 2% on national defense. The others, what is that? Poland. Poland think that Russia as a neighbor is no joke. And then you have Greece, with a rotten economy, at least spending money on defense. And the United Kingdom, and the US, and after that, number six on the list, below 2%, is France, then Turkey, then Norway. Because Norway has increased defense spending as a necessity. So this is a big picture. So into this, what could be the implication as President Trump as a game changer? 
while if I try to relax and think the following way, I have to deal with a man who experienced some real estate. We start there, that you should end there, okay. I have to look at the sensible questions from any US government to ask European countries to increase money on defense, which I think is fair. All the representatives from President Trump, Minister of Defense, his Vice President, his Foreign Minister, and his National Security, Security Advisor, Mr. General McMaster. Well, they are spoken in a way who can give me some relaxing. But I don't like the situation. And what I would like from at least this part of the US and all part of the US is to adhere to this international treaty. Because you can never know what will, what will happen if you change a thing and hope that it will turn out good. And if you want to keep predictability in the high north, you want nothing more than all the trouble spots in the Middle East, all the trouble spots in Asia, you want no more. So remember the map. Across the Arctic Ocean is Canada and Alaska. So that's part of the world where the European and the North American parts of NATO come together. So it's peaceful. Arctic Council is a peaceful place. I think we should try to keep it that way. And if somebody still thinks that Norway as a loyal part of Norway or NATO can do some soft case operations, behaving in parts of the world where it's not so easy for anybody else to do it. Well, if you do that, you've got a lot of understanding. But the understanding takes D and D, deterrence and dialogue. And I said in Grand Fox in 2009, to have a credible defense, you've got to have a stick yourself, but you've got to have a friend with a bigger stick. And that's a quotation for Teddy Roosevelt. And so that's a part of it, it's burden sharing. And a small country is up on its own. And we know we cannot stand to alone. Finland had a fight against Russia. It was a bloody thing for the Russians, but, and also for the Finnish people. They lost. The Finnish people are very clever people, so they don't speak too much about defense. Because they learned two things which will be the end of my speech here today. I once asked a Polish professor, he was a Polish liberal, and it's not lots of Polish liberals. So I asked him, what is your best advice to me as a Norwegian politician calling Russia? And he said, point one, be fair, they are proud people. Respect proud people. Always respect proud people. Point number two, never, never, never stop talking about the rule of law. Well, how can you do business when there is no rule of law? How can you do business and anything else without the rule of law? Nothing. Anarchy, chaos. The biggest guy is cheating all over our people. You've got to have some predictability, You've got to have some rules. That was his two advices. I listened very well to him because I think it was very wise. So after the invasion in Ukraine, Norway didn't, as other Western countries didn't, we didn't join up on the Red Square in Moscow in 2015 to remember the victory of the Nazi Germany. That was correct. But then we did a very stupid thing. The Russians had the remembrance on the border between Russia and Norway. And you must now learn the following facts, that at the end of the Second World War, the Red Army liberated the eastern parts of northeastern Norway. They lost approximately 15 to 20,000 soldiers doing that. It's much more than any Norwegian casualty during the Second World War. We should have been there and said, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We can have two thoughts in our mind. Thank you, and also thank you for another reason. Because one of the few places which Stalin left voluntarily was Norway. He came and he left. And he should have the sense to say thank you. You should show respect without being stupid. You should always show respect without being naive. And that was stupid of us not to do it. We were not living up to our standards by doing that. It was very correct not to be in the Red Square. But there are all those things which you can think about. So, 
Trump and Putin here is only presented as big leaders in big countries. Putin is not regulated by any kind of Supreme Court, but any constitution, he can do what he wants. President Trump cannot do what he wants, he is regulated by the US Constitution and everything else. And that's the great thing about the United States of America, that there exists a constitution. And there exists the balance of power between a mighty president, correct, House of Representatives, the Senate, and courts. It's very important, very important, as basics. So I'm an open-minded person, but as a Norwegian, I understand we have to do much more in defense, and we have to make any part of the US electorate and US citizens aware on the common situation, the common ground. And I shall speak more about that because I decided to use 40 minutes, I've used 45 minutes. <laughs> That's five minutes too much. And we should leave it up to comments, open questions, and so on. But this is the basic map. There is very few people living here. Very few people. And one of the places where they're living, a lot of people, is called Spitsbergen in Norway, where there are a community in the city called Longyearbyen, which is named by an American by the name of James Longyear. So they named this mining town, this was a company town, but which nowadays is a research place. That's Longyearbyen, and I think that's the northernmost place in the world with a regular flight service every day. It's regularly going a Boeing 737-700 or something like that in that direction, both ways. So it's, it's easy to get there, and I've been there many times. I've also been to the north of that, which is a place called Neoborosum, where there exist research facilities in all countries except the US. Russia is there, China is there, United Kingdom is there, many people are there, great American universities are there, but it's a research facility in my know. It's very important to get that knowledge. So thank you for listening to me. I've tried to present A, NATO, to Norway and NATO, C, the high north, D, Russia, and E, something about Trump and Putin, in the way I see about it, and I'm used to, when I meet American audiences, I shall be direct. So that's my pretend behavior. I also learned from Americans that if you take yourself down, nobody else will respect you for what you, other thing that you say. So I present myself on a level I think I should be, a proud citizen of a free country. And a proud citizen of a free country believing in an alliance between citizens in free countries. That's my background, that's my platform, and that's the platform I want to defend. But I understand it takes some efforts from the other side also, not only the effort from the rich guy. So thank you. Have time for some questions. Right. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very interesting speech. What I was interested in is I know that Norway has a long tradition of being a proud democracy, and I was wondering what the view from Norway is in light of the nationalist movements and Eurosceptic movements that have risen across Europe and what's happening and what that will do to EU unity and to NATO unity moving forward. Just to be personal, um, I'm a Norwegian liberal. You must, I'm somewhere in the US, I would have been as, a center part of the Democratic Party. But I have no problems to speak with pragmatic Republicans. And as I met a lot of them here in Red Fox. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a person in politics, like to divide politics in three. I have to say that first. There is, there is a place for intense fight. It's a place for competition, and it's a big place for cooperation. So with that background, I will answer your question. <coughs> Norway as a country has voted no two times to join the European Union, but we are pragmatic people. We didn't want to join a Eurozone, which was not economically sound and not politically sound, but we wanted to be part of the market. 
So by the European Area Economic Agreement, we are part of the market. That is to say, we are accepting all of our freedoms of movement of services, trade, capital, and people. And I think, as a person who lives in a country where 50% of the population went to the US, 50%, 50%, I think I should accept that people come from Poland and Lithuania and other places to find a job in Norway, when I can find a job in Norway, do their obligations and live in our country. I support that. And I very much dislike this hate against foreigners. I really do that. I really do that. And some of the undercurrents in the Dutch elections coming in a short time, and the French elections are strongly undercurrents on that. But I don't think it's fair to say this the same thing about Britain. Because part of Britain is like the Rust Belt in the US. If global free trade gave great chances to the middle class in China, hundreds of millions, middle class in India, hundreds of millions, and the super rich, it left some people behind. Lots of those people in the United States, lots of those people in parts of Europe, lots of those people, for instance, in Britain. So, it's a necessity to give an answer to that question. You cannot look at people and say, we don't see you, we don't like you. It's not acceptable. I think that at the end of the day, Marine Le Pen will not win the French election. Marine Le Pen is receiving money support from Putin. Putin is giving money to all the parties on the extreme right and the extreme left in Europe. To, to discredit Western institutions is one of his main tasks. At one, long before I heard about Breitbart News, long before that, I listened to Russia today. Have you ever done that? Well, for some coincidence, I was in Burma, Myanmar, because I was in 2015 to protect Monclu Forest, which is the blue forest, trees growing in salt water and which keeps very much of CO2 emissions and so on and so on. And there was a satellite receiver and it took in all the Asian channels and Russia today. So I had to look at Russia today. And I know European politics. I read my papers. I read my sources. I read things I dislike. I read things I like and so on. And suddenly there were modern time TV presenters speaking about things I know about, but speaking from an angle I could not accept. So that was fake news, really. I, ha I had no knowledge about that fake news before I came to Myanmar, but it's a global world, so you can see it anywhere. So I think this is the biggest, so even if I voted not Norway not joining European Union from the reasons I said, I was very much against Brexit because some of the undercurrents. Because when people have managed in some way to keep something peaceful, which before that was very bloody, I cannot uh, shout loudly when you tear it down. But the British people wrote it and we have to respect that. We have to respect that. And the opposition in Britain is nothing like, nothing, nothing like what's happening in France. And I follow the opinion polls in France and I think they are at least as accurate as 538 Nate Silver. And Nate Silver was a person who at least pre predicted the popular vote at the US election. And he was careful about the state level. He was careful, I noticed. And as a person, I didn't like the situation because I saw too few polls of Michigan and Wisconsin in such places. Very few polls, but leave that aside. Now there's a fight between a national proudness, which I accept, and an open attitude which is against protectionism, but which is supporting free trade, but you must have an, two additions from my point of view. You must have one addition on climate, but the second addition you must have something which picks up all those poor people who lose out in that competition. And that's an obligation for politicians locally, regionally, and internationally. You cannot look at people and say, we don't like you, you lost. It's not fair, it's not acceptable. 
And uh, I would be stupid if I didn't notice that or that was part of the election results in the US. I would be really stupid if I didn't look into that. So that's my answer on Europe. And for the first time, possibly in France, there can be a politician from the center who can win because the socialists have gone too much to the left and the mainstream conservatives have a candidate which is under suspicion from, uh, because he is possibly has misused funds, being a member of the French parliament and so on. But it's very open elections. In Germany, the situation is different because the mainstream parties in Germany have stood up against the challenge. And I think Germany is really, really interesting. I shall make that very short. There are two stories of Germany. First story, how come that such a country went into a dark, deep, black hole and created all those extreme bad things? But question number two, how come that it was possible to climb up again and build institutions with strength. You can stand up against deviation, so to speak, and manage to have leaders who can stand in the storm. Interesting story. Interesting story. And Mr. Putin's attack on the European institutions is really an attack on Germany making up with Germany after the Second World War. It was the German politics who wanted the 1975 agreement. All borders shall be fixed. So Germany had lost all those parts of the country, which was a result of the Second World War. And Germany asked for human rights question to be part of over Europe. So what is the attack is not only European policy, uh, Atlantic Treaty Organization policy, but it's mainly a German policy to make up after the Second World War people trying to do a decent thing after creating a deep, deep black hole. And I think that's part of the story. It's not, not I cannot answer all the questions. And you are an enlightened person, so you have to follow closely. <laughs> <laughs> you have to read closely. And you have to go to those, so I've been a person who now give contributions to Wikipedia because I know I have to pay people to work voluntarily or something. And I know I have to pay for something I'm not used to pay for. I cannot go reading things cheap and be just an onlooker. I have to pay for something. I have to support people who do credit things. It's not dependent on where I live. It's dependent on whether they are fair. And I can be conservative, I can be liberal, I can be in between. I go to be fair. That's, that's democracy. We have to live with that. So that's part of the rules. But part of that in Europe, to end my answer to you, is the discussion on the rules of the game. And part of that discussion is to be against foreigners. And I cannot, with my background, coming from Norway, which I said, with 50% of the population seeking a new life in the US, very many of them in the Midwest, forget that. It's not possible for me. Other people could do that, but I cannot do that. So we, we, we are subject to the inter interrogation by ourselves, but also other people. That's called scrutiny. That's called democracy. And we must stand up to that. Important questions, big question to long answer. <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you on Tuesday and for this presentation today. I found it very interesting and informative. I'm old enough to remember almost all, if not all, of the Cold War, and it seemed that the uh, rules of engagement at that time was who had the biggest machinery, who had the most machinery and the most military muscle. Uh, and speaking strictly as a layman, it seemed to me that the tensions eased significantly during the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, today I sense that we could be seeing increased tensions. And going forward, I think that, speaking strictly as a layman, seems to me that intelligence gathering and surveillance are going to be the key tools of the trade rather than hard military equipment. Do you have a, uh, do you agree with that assessment first and foremost and uh, do you have a sense of where the NATO countries stand compared to the Soviet uh, compared to Russia in terms of our surveillance and intelligence gathering capabilities? No, I agree to that assessment because if if you shall not stumble into something, you would have knowledge. 
And uh, there was a situation during the Cuba crisis when Curtis LeMay didn't tell President Kennedy that he had heightened the DEFCON rate for the US nuclear forces. And he was told in plain language by Kennedy that you shall not do such things because I'm the supreme commander and I know my responsibility. <clears throat> so, military shall not do something alone, but to be good politicians with such big responsibilities and be good military, you've got to have the things you speak about as a necessity. And it should be open. And uh, what I mentioned as part of my speech it's that the Russians, at least on part of the battlefield, have developed some remarkable jamming capacities. Remarkable. And uh, they also developed a concept, which I didn't speak about, but which goes into your question. They have developed the sense to make a war without making a war. So let's use the following example. There suddenly turns out 50 persons in the northeast of Norway in Norwegian Home Guard uniforms. They speak perfectly Norwegian. They are not Norwegian. <coughs> Very pitiful if we should have no people there to understand them Norwegian. <laughs> and the next patrol is a police patrol who is to drive for two hours to come there and say hello. This kind of manipulating news, uh, creating anxiety, intimidating people, and so on, is part of the game. So you need great assessment to stand up to that. And the chief of the Norwegian military intelligence said concerning fake news from Russia, that he didn't think that Norwegian population would fall for it because they found it too stupid. But it takes a, a very educated population with good leaders to speak directly and accountably so you can check out what is your sources, to stand up to that. Democracy is nothing for lazy people. So <coughs> you have to have the knowledge, you have to share the knowledge, and you have to have all of those things. So this is not comments against anything which you said. It's only the democratic side of it, which is part of your assessment. I agree to it. And I just told that Norway is very important to part of that intelligence. I think that um, I go to the map. You don't want to have a nuclear submarine coming here with undetected that suddenly coming up here. Really, we really don't want that. Nobody want, would want that. So, yes, so you are very correct. It's very important, but got to have deterrence. You've got to have some people. And to quote McMasters, you need boots on the ground. You can all have all the high tech you have. But if you leave out the human factor, if you leave out boots on the ground, you leave out the most important deterrence. Namely citizens who are proud of their country will stand up to that, and military forces who are part of that. You really need that. That's not against those assessments of intelligence, but it's it is a necessity to have it. And we have a big debate in our country, because some of our military thinks it's very heroic to fire a missile and kill lots of people, but it's very unheroic to have soldiers. And I don't think that way. You can have all the missiles you need but you've got to have boots on the ground. You've got to have people, at least in my country, who know that I live exactly here and you don't belong here. That's called a local environment. That's called to be proud of your environment. That's called to be part of an environment where, as a volunteer, you run out when there is an accident, when there is a natural catastrophe with big scale. You run out and take part of it. You're part of a volunteer effort which is part of the civil society. So, good military is part of that, and it's ne it is a necessity to have it. And we have a big discussion in Norway on the scale of our land power, our home guard and our army and so on. I didn't bring it into that. 
I just said it as an answer to you. But I think your assessment is very right, and I agree to it. And that was one of my main points on the US Norwegian bilateral situation. But I'm always happy, always very happy for the equipment for the US Expeditionary Marine Force. Happy for that. One, you had a question. You know, I, did, um, I was drafted in 1969. I thought, oh shit, I'm, here comes Vietnam. And the service sent me to school to learn Russian. And I was fascinated. It was a great career. I did that for 10 years. And shortly after I was done, they started dismantling the language training in the United States, including the Arab language program. Anything going on in Norway with uh, training linguistic capabilities? Well, some people think it's enough to be an accountant. <laughs> and I support accountants. And I have a mind to take into my mind numbers very quickly. I have sort of an autistic characteristic here. I know that. But without understanding what Bruce Hewitt is doing, making this innovation center with white walls and turning it into art. And don't understanding that it is not bad business to have art. To think that people can at least have two thoughts in their mind at the same time. I think that's a good thing. And after having met Arne Brecki, this remarkable person have read his travel agency who sends people to know and back again, and which is a professor in Indo-European languages. Remarkable. Because language is to the core of everything. All words have an origin. It tells about identity and so on. And they take, it, they take the case of China. You send the travel person to China and you think that the Chinese are stupid, they're not. China is a very big experiment combining free market economy and ruled by a so-called Communist Party. It's not Marxist anymore, but it's, it's ruling everybody don't like free speech, but what do I stick to Confucius? Old moral principles. And you know nothing about old moral principles. Or you go to Saudi Arabia and you know nothing about Islam. Dangerous. To be stupid on a higher level is not good. <laughs> it's not good. And all those military officers I mentioned, Francis McMasters, he made a great thesis. You can read about that. He's very, very educated. And there was a difference between Eisenhower and MacArthur, even if MacArthur was a great general. But Eisenhower was elected the president, and that was the reason for that. And so if you are educated, you should always respect natural, natural science, life science, mathematics, and so on. But at this, in the same place, it's a necessity to respect his, history and humanities. And I think both in Norway and part of the US, there is a lack of self-esteem in those traits. Because you cannot be counted. But something you can create something beautiful and people will love that. That's a very short answer to the complex question. But it was a defense, defense of humanities and history. And if you lose out from where you come, you can pass the result. And let me end by a historical example. The Kennedy brothers were educated with history as subject. So in 1960-62, Barbara Tuchman produced the book The Guns of August, which was the book upon how Europe stumbled into war by military logic alone in 1914. And they knew that if politicians is not the supreme leaders, you can end into calamities. So that was why John F. Kennedy could shout down Curtis LeMay. But that's one of his Irish compatriots could shout, we have seen that in many books, shout to the commander of the US destroyer outside Cuba, you don't fire that gun till I tell you. Because if you fire the gun at the wrong time, things could turn out. And even in that situation, and we know that because all the archives are open, we have two situations. We know nowadays that Khrushchev and Kennedy were reasonable people. And then you both told them that they could stumble into something. So luckily, luckily, 
the Russians never discovered the U.S. Air Force reconnaissance aircraft, which was lost over Russia and luckily returned without being discovered. And at the same time, we can thank ourselves that there was a two-to-one vote on that Russian submarine outside the U.S. blockade outside Cuba. And the captain was so annoyed by the U.S. presence that he wanted to use his nuclear tip torpedo. And he was shouted down by his two fellow officers. So we can say thank you to those two officers. So to have educated citizens, it's a good thing. So it was a defense of being broad-minded. It was really a defense of liberal arts education, uh, which I think is a good thing. It's a good thing to, to know more than, than your own trade. It's fine. And for me, it's also a question of curiosity. And Bruce just presented it. Just go and look. It's a fabulous innovation center. You meet businessmen who think that academia is not arrogant. Fine. I like that. I like that. And you can see people in academia creating something which is full of art. Because there is no contradiction. They come together. No, that was another kind of question that NATO, but that's okay. <laughs> Our final question. We started it out. Uh, the American College of Norway is 25 years old. It has started a very special relationship between the small college of Norway and the University of North Dakota. You have gotten greatly interested and a fabulous advocate for the American College of Norway. Why? No, because, uh, I have to make it very really short. Point one, to live in a nation where I can live in a good place because one million left. I should be thankful. I should be thankful to the country who received them and gave them a possibility. And point number two, those people who left Norway believed in education. The first thing I did was to build a barn and then the church and then the school. You should have respect for God and a teacher. Okay for you. Just okay for you. And then you could build the house you live in. I like that. You created great universities, at least five of them, one on the west coast in the state of Washington. I think in Iowa, Wisconsin, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Fine. So out of that knowledge, the Norwegian Parliament did a stupid thing. We closed down our consulate in Minneapolis, forgetting the majority of it. I disliked it, but we lost. So you must do things to keep things open. And the American College of Norway was a way to give Norwegian students possibility to go into the freshman year of the US education, come into the US education. And it has also given throughout the years American students to come to Norway and pick up something which they possibly didn't expect, but they picked it up. And throughout the years, it's been 2,000 of that. That's a great number. So to put it very shortly, with the university had to cut the budget by 20 million, that's not a joke. But it is a small investment to send those lecturers to Norway and make 2,000 people traveling forth. And to let faculty go out and picking up something which is different. Just enhance your mind. And I've seen it, so that's why I support it. And when our bureaucracy, because all countries are bureaucracies, and all bureaucracies, for fair reasons, believe they are the best in the world. That's, that's the thing everywhere. And suddenly you meet this phenomenon, American College of Norway. It doesn't fit into the Norwegian system. <laughs> no, for sure, it does not. It's only a lecture, it's, it has only very good lecturers coming from fine US university. But those lectures doesn't do research when I know why. No, but they come from a community that do research. So what happened then? Politicians of all kinds in Parliament, I was part of that process. I, I gave advice to Krista Lovelace and said, Krista, you shall write your case in maximum one page. You shall not be shy. You shall be direct. The result of that was broadly accepted by politicians. And politicians said to the bureaucracy, find a solution. We want a solution for this extraordinary institution. So, 
That was the budget year for 2016. Then I come back again with another question. And the politician said once more, find a solution. Because this is a very important institution, we like it. And then to, to finish it, I think it's for the University of North Dakota, it's a bridgehead to all other kinds for Norwegian universities. You have the smallest medical faculty in the US. Right? The northern part of Norway, you have rural medicine, common interest. You will find oil and gas, we can always discuss what we took to do with it, but you found it. And in the rest of our countries, we are excellent institutions to educate engineers to deal with such challenges. So I think this UND American Coach of Norway Alliance is a door opener for university. And I have nothing against people from me going to Shanghai. Good luck. It's fine. But in Norway, you need friendly people where for a small investment, you get a great payback. And the payback is people who get knowledge, who strengthen bonds between people in two different countries, learn something, enhance their mind. You are engineer, you pick up something on humanities. You are humanities, you pick up something on life science, and so on, very important. And it's, it, it, it is an international agreement which works. So that's why I love it. And I'm a politician who likes things to work. And I'm a politician in my life who always jumped the pants when it was lowest. If I want to achieve something, I can run my head into the wall. It takes no talent. I can do it once to be courageous and save my case. Second time I have to find a solution. I have one, one exception to that. If it's deep conscience, that's another question. But in all of the ways of life, you have, you have to find a solution. And I think this UND, American College of Norway, connection is remarkable in the sense that it go outside all systems. And I like people who change systems. I really like people who change systems. And it's decent and good politics, independent on your name or party that you can change the system because you see that as a necessity. You are not obliged to be a deaf, dumb, and silent listener. You have to do something. So that's how we understood each other, very fast. Very fast, because it's a way to behave. Yeah, I, I love this institution. That's, that's part of it. And when I've been in Grand Fox, it's always been very extraordinary. And Yes, it has been. I must not speak more. So the short answer is a lovable experiment. It's, it's an intelligent experiment. It's a small scale experiment. And it gives great benefit back again from a small amount of money. Of course, in a tough budget, what's a small amount of money? That's sending lecturers abroad for some time. I'm thankful that has, that has been done up to now. I hope it will be kept. I think that's important for everybody. And I think parts of the Norwegian American thing is to think about the past. And I have nothing against people going to mine it and eating lutefisk and squeezing lips. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. But I would like also people to know contemporary Norway. And I have nothing, nothing against respecting tradition, really. I like that, but you have to do something else also. Not instead, but also. And I think this combination between UND and American culture in Norway is just to make that bridgehead, make that connection and making it work. And that's beautiful. So why should you destroy something which works? It's very easy to destroy something which works. It takes quite a lot of time to create something which works. So that's my argument. Very good. Please join me in thanking our speaker, Odarn.